Welcome, everyone, to What's Working. I'm Cam Marston. The focus of this show is to uncover the workplace and the workforce, and perhaps even today, the consumer habit trends that will help you get a little bit better at what it is that you do. Maybe our guest will say something that triggers an idea or a thought that makes you lead people, that makes you recruit and retain people, that makes you sell your product or services a little bit differently. Always looking for thought leaders in the area as well as beyond to talk to them about the way they see the world. And as we do this, it's getting to be the season. What season? Well, holiday season, of course. Christmas season, more particular, at least in my household. The lights are up, the trees are up, and there's a festive feeling going on. And every evening during this time of year, the thought enters my head of, my goodness, things are are, are really moving around here, things... There's a lot of spirit and there's a lot of optimism. We're even having a fire in the fireplace during wheat nights. Wouldn't a glass of wine taste good? Well, the answer to that question for a guy like me is almost always, yeah, I think it would. But it's this time of year that I really enjoy a glass of wine a little bit more than others. For some reason, the holiday season, I think, makes the wine I drink somewhere between 4.5 and 11.6% better. And if there's a fire in the fireplace, it goes up exactly two to three percentage points each time. Wine is a confusing topic for most of us. There's certainly people out there listening that really can talk wine and really get into the nuances of wine. They have a vocabulary that's that a thesaurus would envy, quite frankly. They are a living, breathing thesaurus as they tell you that the wine that you're drinking tastes a little bit about bees and honey and, in fact, bees that are, are left-handed bees. And it tastes like the pollen was, was gathered on a Wednesday afternoon on a sunny day. It's amazing what they pull out of this stuff. And it can be a very confusing topic for people like me. There's so many varieties, there's so many brands, there's so many there's so much rumor about it. Well, the holiday season is time to jump in to the wine trends. I suspect that the majority of wine is drunk during the holiday season, and I'm going to get that confirmed with Jim Cox. He's going to be my guest when we come back from break here in a little bit. He and his wife Carrie opened Southern Napa in 2012, and it's a little old farmhouse over there in Daphne. And uh, they do a lot of uh, wine business. And uh, undoubtedly, the coronavirus and the impact it's had on the retail world has impacted the way they sell wine. But what I doubt it's impacted is how much wine they sell. My suspicion is those numbers will be up a good bit. And I'm curious from Jim if they've had to learn to connect with their consumer a little bit different, if they've had to sell it, you know, actually put it in the consumer's hands a little bit differently. I'm wondering if there are wine trends that have evolved out of the coronavirus that has surprised them. I'm curious if there are wines that people tend to prefer in the holiday season or whatever it may be. It's always a fascinating topic. The depth of conversation that you can get into in and around wine is always interesting. And you might just hear some wine being poured in the background. There's got to be an upside to the work, right? There's got some wine being poured in the background as Jim talks to us about the wine business, the trends shaping his business, the trends in his customers. And while we're at it, why don't we have a little while we go along? You're listening to What's Working. I'm Cam Marston. We'll be right back after this break with Jim Cox, Southern Napa Wine House. my family, Turn to the Experts is more than a tagline. It's a promise. Every Keith technician is an experienced AC professional, and that saves you money. Speaking of money, how about 0% financing for up to 60 months on installations of new carrier systems? Keith and Carrier, Turn to the Experts. Mobile's leading name and comfort since 1964. License number 83731. The best, most cost-efficient ways to talk to customers about who you are and what you do is through signs, simple, effective signs. Hi, I'm Kim Marston, host of What's Working. 
Signorama is the Mobile Area's leader in helping you design and build signs advertising your business. What kinds? All kinds of signs. All kinds. Find Signorama on Facebook or at signorama-mobile.com. Think about how people really see you. The kid at the drive-thru just sees a coffee drinker. Please pull forward. Your local barista sees the person who loves a smiley face in their latte. See you next time. It's kind of the same way with insurance. Other insurance companies just see a customer, but a State Farm agent sees more. They see you as a neighbor. Your State Farm agent is here to get to know who you really are so they can help life go right. Call me, State Farm agent Allison Horner, and Mobile at 666-1616. You're listening to What's Working. I'm Cam Marston. I'm in the studio today with Jim Cox. He is the co-owner of Southern Napa, which he opened in 2012, which combines all the things he loves about Napa and Southern hospitality. Jim, thank you so much for your time. Welcome to What's Working. Hello, my friend. Great to be here. We have done a number of episodes in this small studio here that's being hosted at Deep Fried Studios, but we've never had what's on the table in front of us now, and that is four opened bottles of wine. That's why we're here. Yes, that is why we're here. And when you offered to bring some wine, I said, sure, absolutely. Let's be give honest, this Cam a try. Said you can come on the podcast if you bring wine to drink. If not, stay home. That yeah. was kind of wisdom. That, I love an ultimatum. I love a particularly good ultimatum <laughs> that involves several open bottles of wine. So the holiday season, which we're entering into right now, is a big time of year, I suppose, for the wine business. Yeah. Is it similar to other retail in that this is the month of the year that you make all your money? It is. I mean, it's, we're very holiday driven. You know, Thanksgiving was, uh, we had a good Thanksgiving about on par with last year. But we were a little concerned coming in because of smaller group gatherings, uh, not as many people having big family events, so maybe you didn't need to buy as much um, wine. But you know, we were about like we were last year, but this is the time of year uh, because you have not only usual get togethers, but gifts, corporate gifts. I mean, a bottle of wine is such a great gift to give someone uh, because it's consumable. I think especially as we all get a little older, we like something that you can use and be done with as opposed to having to put it in a box somewhere. So uh, there's there's no doubt the the holiday season is, you know, our biggest time of year. How much in advance do you have to begin thinking about your holiday orders? Is this something like summertime that you have to start putting those orders in? So Carrie, my wife, who's the the brains, the beauty, everything in the store, um, you know, really has a good handle on that. And, and so, you know, we're not because of the way the alcohol laws work in the state of Alabama, we have to get our wines through a local distributor. So it's not like we're ordering from we can't even order from our friends in Napa to have it shipped us. We have to go through a, a distributor. So they're the ones that warehouse it, stock it. They they get loaded up, but then we're looking at, okay, we're going to know this is something we do want to make sure we highlight during the holiday season or maybe run a special on or part of our wine club. And so then that's when Carrie really makes those decisions when to reserve those wines and then bring them into the store. Uh, is there a type of wine that people drink more of in the holiday season that they wouldn't drink uh, any other time of year? You know, because of our climate down here, um, you know, white wines uh, are very popular throughout the summer. Obviously, it's it's so warm and hot. Uh, a lot of people don't like to drink reds, big reds. They like their lighter wines, rosés and white wines. But uh, as the holiday season comes on, like Cabernet and Pinot Noir, neck and neck in our in our store for red wines. And, and that's, that's it. Those are the two big wines. They go great with food. They're big bodied. Everybody can find something they like. If you like red wine, everybody can find either a cab or a Pinot that they like. Where did you get your expertise? So it's all, it's, it's so my, so Carrie worked for uh, Disney and William Sonoma. Those are the two companies she worked for before this. And, you know, we had kind of had this thought since, you know, probably 20 years ago, when you're in your thirties, you think, you know what you're doing and, and like, well, certainly we could open a wine store. And then, uh, and then we got to be in our early forties and we actually did it. And we were like, wow, we really didn't know. We don't know what we're doing now. We <laughs> certainly would not have known back, back then. So, and, and my back, yeah, I'm a, I'm a marketing guy and uh, kind of a hustler. So that's what I bring, but carry with that retail high end customer service um, training that she'd gone through with those two companies. You know, we were kind of in a place where, 
for her to continue her career, we were going to have to leave, move somewhere else to grow with one of those two companies. And we really liked it here. So we just kind of said, all right, let's let's do it for ourselves. No kidding. So she chose a retail job. Very few people seem to choose retail. They want to get out of retail. And then we have COVID that's landed on us, which has not been friendly to retail. If you own factories or warehouses, you're doing great. If you are in right. re- retail, you're lucky to have someone come through the door. How you guys been doing? So we, you know, luckily, again, not to bore everybody with Alabama state alcohol laws, but you know, you you can't sell wine online. You can't, we can't ship wine to anybody, even within the state of Alabama. You can't do any of those things. But we had launched an online store where people could go on, reserve their li- wines online, pick them up at the store, still had to come there. So we'd been doing that, uh, started in 2018 before COVID. So luckily we had that in place and weren't scrambling to try to come up with a, a way to make that work. So that worked well. But for, for us, you know, what we're kind of known for are, are special events, wine tastings, winemaker dinners, bringing in rock stars from Napa to be there with us. And we haven't had anybody had a, have a drink inside our, our house, our wine store, our fine wine house, we call it, since, since March. Really? So we haven't served one glass of wine inside the store since March. Let's and, begin with some wine. Yeah. Let's let, as we, as we, this conversation unfolds, let's, let's, Teach us first about what I'm about, what you've put in front of me, and uh, and we'll have a conversation over this glass. Just uh, like a couple simple things, and I and I'm like I ne- I don't want to be one of those guys that has to analyze every glass of wine I drink. I just want to drink. A lot of times, I just want to drink a glass of wine and not have to try to think about hints of cocoa and butternut and those type things. So uh, Sauvignon Blanc. I mean, super easy drinking, great. Um, and this one is from New Zealand. So uh, known for their Sauvignon Blanc. So you smell, you kind of get a smell, and if you've got a big nose like me, get it down in the, in the glass, and you can kind of smell. And what you smell and I smell could be totally different things, but you're not right, and I'm not wrong, and vice versa. It's how everybody perceives it. But, like, I think of this, and I kind of get a little sweet tarts. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Little, so, so just we'll give that a taste. John Thompson, please play along. John Thompson is in here with us, folks. He is the producer of the show, and he has chosen to not have a microphone for some strange reason. So um, so a New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc has a very distinctive um, taste. So, uh, and since this is, you know, radio and podcast, it's hard to uh, really convey that. But uh, is there anything you uh, pops into your... You know, I've always, and I, I, I'm not a big wine connoisseur, but I do like a, what I call a crisp Sauvignon mm-hmm. Blanc, which I find typically come out of New Zealand more than anywhere else. And I always, and this may be because they're called this, I always feel like I taste a kiwi fruit. I totally get that. Yeah? So, mm-hmm, absolutely. So I'm okay? Absolutely. And, it, and, and even if it doesn't, if that's what you taste, that's... That's what's great about wine. We're not drinking Coke and Pepsi. Like, right. You know, it's supposed to be different and different to different people. So that's great. So that's obviously grown in uh, New Zealand, way different climate. So I know it's it's crazy to dump that out, but that's yeah, what we do in a wine against the code. tasting. So same grape, uh, exact same grape, grown in uh, Napa Valley. It's a Napa uh, Sauvignon Blanc. It's called Joseph George. It's a friend of ours. We stay on his uh, property. He makes about... 300 cases a year. Um, and so same grape, but I just want you to taste. All right. Here we go with the taste, everyone. I don't taste the crisp. I don't taste the kiwi. It's radically, it's, yeah. radically different. Same grape. Yeah. Grown in different soil, in a different climate. And that's, that's what's great about, that's what's great about wine. You want that New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc to taste like where it grows, right. the climate it's in. Don't try to make it be something it's not. And this is much different. Yeah, I think you get more mineral, more of a mineral taste out of the uh, Joseph George. But yeah. it's, um, but it's also it is clean. It's bright, um, but it's just a. I just want to do it. It's a fun little comparison. And what we love uh, at Southern Napa is if somebody says they like Sauvignon Blanc, and you say, if you came in and you said, well, I really like New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc. Well, great. I'm not going to try to change it into a Napa Sauvignon Blanc. Right. Let me find you a, a great New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc that you'll enjoy. Yeah. So let's talk about the wine is is often intimidating to most people. And I'm one of those guys. I can be very intimidated when I get into you know, someone. I go to a restaurant and they put the wine menu down in front of you and you look at it and it's, 
you know, there's 300 bottles of wine in there, and that's a small wine list for some organizations. And you go, I, you know, I don't know. Throw a dart, just don't let it land on an expensive one. So, and, and you don't want to mispronounce the name. You don't want to look right. foolish uh, there. And the second least expensive bottle on the wine list is always the bottle that the restaurant's making the most on. The second least because, expensive. I mean, a, a big guy like Cam's not going to order the cheapest bottle, but he'll order the second cheapest bottle, and that's exactly what they'd like you to. Um, yeah. Uh, to do so, so that's that's it, and that's that's what we try not to be pretentious about wine because it's it's just wine, and and my my thought and Carrie's thought has always been drink what you like at a price you're comfortable paying for it. Yeah, I mean it's, it's your palate, it's your wallet. Man, don't so if that's if that's ten dollars a bottle or if it's twenty dollars a bottle or fifty whatever it is, do that and don't let somebody shame you into. Thinking that oh I I, I shouldn't drink that I, it, that's it's it's your money and what you enjoy and if you like that bottle of wine drink it. So when the waiter looks at me asked for after I've ordered my bottle of wine and he says, really, <laughs> that's when I should go. Hey pal, just go run fetch that glass of bottle of wine for me. Yes, something like that. I, I mean I think that's a that's a very great way to to put it. And most you know if you the, the waiter or if you if you're at a different place a, a song might be should be able to make a recommendation but like and you should never be embarrassed by whatever bottle you order off the wine list yeah ever. never well it's uh it's it like i said it can be imposing but it's so i find wine and, and I, again i'm not a connoisseur cigars are somewhat the same way but, but and you don't uh, have to be a connoisseur to enjoy wine like that's scotch. just it they have so subtleties of flavor in there that once I've learned to taste them, mm -hmm. I enjoy the pursuit of them. So it becomes not just going back to my same favorite bottle of New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc. It's, I wonder how this one is different from this one. And I may not have the vocabulary to explain, it tastes like crushed roses on a Tuesday. <laughs> uh, I may not have the vocabulary, but I love finding these subtle differences of them and being able to taste it and talk to somebody about it. And that's and that's what you don't get at a grocery store or a big box store. You don't walk down the aisle and somebody can interact with you and talk to you about that. That's that's what an independent wine store does, you know. Like we have Carrie is spectacular at pairing food and, and wine. And so we actually have people who will be making something for dinner. They'll make a sauce and they'll bring in a little bit of it in a little container to carry and say, can you taste this? Oh, wow. And just be like, what do you, what do you recommend to pair with this? Yeah. She's like, and she's got an amazing palate. I'm just kind of a knucklehead about that. But she's so, but that's, you can't do that at a grocery store. When we come back, I want to talk to you about who your competitors are. Obviously you can go to a grocery store and get wine. You can go to Costco and get wine. There's, it's, 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 it's not hard to find the stuff. So who is your competitor? Um, as well as who is your customer. And we'll pick that up when we come back. I'm Matt Armbruster with Ransom Ministries. We help people in our community that most others have given up on. Please donate your unwanted electronics to Ransom Recycling. We teach life skills, job readiness, and job creation through our electronic recycling program. We take anything with a cord. Find us at RansomMinistries.com or you can call us at 251-751-0044. Human Resource Department spend countless hours on insurance billing mistakes, Obamacare rules, and compliance. Employee benefits serve the purpose of recruiting, retaining, and rewarding employees. We can handle all of your benefit needs with cost-effective products, employee enrollments, and handle your HR issues. Benefit admin doesn't have to be complicated. My name is Michael Cowart Jr. of the Cowart Group, and we specialize in helping businesses with their employee benefit packages. Visit CowartAssociates.com. Over the break, we opened another bottle. We've poured another glass. Jim, what are we drinking now? So uh, Dave Miner from Miner Family Winery has become a great friend of ours in, in Napa. Matter of fact, we were out there a few years ago, and our two great employees that went with us stayed at his guest house. He comes here. His daughter just enrolled this year at the University of Alabama. Um, he makes great, great wines. And we love when we know the owner, the winemaker, the guy who grows the grapes, and that's and talking about competition a little bit, that's what we 
love. But this is a 2017 Syrah, and it's from the Stagecoach Vineyard, which is a legendary vineyard in um, Napa that was just sold last year for, it was never public, but the rumors were um, like maybe three fifty three or fifty million dollars. Really? How many million acres million, was million, that? I can't, um, was, I can't remember how many planted acres it was, but it's it's some of the finest it produces some of the finest juice on the planet. And yeah. so that's that's uh that that was kind of the rumored rumored number. And if it's off by a little bit, it's still a it's still a pretty big a, number. A yeah. Lot. So you're off by a ten percent. It's still a pretty big number. Yes. We've got some land in Clark County if he's still buying <laughs> if he's used to playing that, we, that amount. Know, we can grow some good stuff in Clark County. Uh is it wine? Grapes are not what we were good at growing down. Yeah, here. yeah. Not, not not good. So go ahead with the description. So uh Syrah, so just uh uh you taste that. Syrah is um w- uh, a grape that a lot of winemakers love to drink. It's blended a lot. It goes into um, a lot of Cabernets, just a little bit of it to help round it out a little bit. Um, you know, one thing I uh, I read this, I can't remember where, somebody talking about drinking wine. And, and again, I, I'm just like, you You just have to know what you like and enjoy it. That's what I, that's always my feeling. But one thing to think about is in your mouth, does it feel like skim milk? Is it super thin? Does it feel maybe like uh, whole milk or say maybe 2% where it's a little thicker? Or does it feel like whole milk? Like it's really viscous. It's big in your mouth. And Mm -hmm. those are things that that you start to learn a little bit as you drink more wine and compare them. And you might find out, oh, I really like that big, bold taste. And I like the Cabernets that make the corners of my mouth just suck in like like that. So, um, again, that's just kind of just drinking wine and just – Picking, remembering those things a little bit. And it's like, oh, yeah, I kind of remember that. Because most of us buy a bottle of wine, drink it. If we really like it, throw it away. And then it's a month later, like, what, yeah. what, was, that, what was that wine I liked? I can't, I can't remember. So I'd love to go to the next restaurant and look at the waiter and say, I want one that has the body of whole milk and makes my cheeks tuck in. And he'll go, he I should, know that he one. He should bring you like a 20... 20- 12 to 14 Napa Valley Cabernet. Like yeah. that's what we should bring you, like a big wine. Let's get into your customers. Yes. Uh, let's start with your competitors. So we mentioned Costco. Uh, there, there are other wine stores around mm. town. Tell me who your competitor is. Is it any place that sells wine or do you see it differently? So it's so funny is the um, the kind of our, our Sherpa, the, the, the first Sauvignon Blanc from Napa Valley we tasted. Um, this man owns the most amazing wine store in um San Jose, right in the heart of Silicon Valley. His family's been in the business for a hundred years, and he said, "You can't have a. I would not have a bottle of wine, bottle of white wine under thirty dollars in my store, and I would not have a bottle of red wine under fifty in my store." And I said, "Bert, I love you. You're in you're in Silicon Valley. You're in Silicon Valley. Yeah, I'm in Daphne, Alabama, town of twenty thousand people. Like it's not gonna it's not gonna work. So we have to you know uh, be a little different with that. We're not there, but we're closer to there than we thought we would ever." Um, B. So go to a grocery store. There's just there's just wines upon wines upon wines down the down the aisles. And probably 80 percent of those wines come from three companies. Oh, really? Yes. And so big conglomerates that own, you know, hundreds of labels and they slap a label on it and and that's it. And I'm not saying that there's that those are bad wines. There's some really crappy wines at grocery stores, but they're not all like that. And there's some wine that we sell at our store that is sold at grocery stores. But we do tend to be more uh, high-end wines, uh, but it's really that that service that we want to be able to provide you, you know, and we want to sell wines that, first of all, every bottle in our store, Carrie or Camille or Lindsay that works there, they've tasted that wine. Mm-hmm. They know what that wine tastes like. And so they, um, they can talk you through that wine. You don't get that at a at a grocery store. You don't get that at Costco. And I love Costco, but you don't get that there. An independent wine store, that's what you that's what you get. But you know, we're very Napa heavy because that's where we go at least once a year, sometimes three times a year, and it's not only have we tasted the wines, but we know the winemaker. Yeah. Like we know the guy who makes that that wine. And so then when you want to go to Napa with friends or family, so Dave Miner is a great example. Uh, six women from Fairhope were going on a girl's trip to Napa, called and said, hey, got some recommendations. We love setting you up with people we know. Dave Miner called him and said, hey, got six friends coming there. Perfect. I'll meet him. He takes them down in the caves and they do a private tasting sitting down in his caves, drinking right out of the barrel, learning about great things. 
that's kind of the experience we like to share in the store. And then because we know these people, that's how, that's what we want our customers to be able to experience. Yeah. So that's, that's it. But you know, we've got customers who come in and like they're, they drink a $12, um, uh, Pinot Grigio that they love. Uh, like there's one gentleman who's a, a painter would come in every Friday after he got off work in his paint clothes. Cause his wife loved that. And he would stop in every Friday and pick a bottle up and take it home. So it, again, if you come in and you, you spend $12, only $12, we don't, think of you in any different way than if you come in and buy a $50 bottle of wine. You know, I've always wanted somebody in your position. And I had a musician in here a couple of weeks ago and I asked him a similar question. When people order wine, do you have assumptions about them? Uh, I asked the musician, when they request a song, do you make assumptions <laughs> about them? And most people answer correctly and say, no, I'm not judgmental. I don't condemn based on the wine they order. I want somebody to tell me the truth. So if this guy comes in and orders a $12 Grigio, you're like, yeah, I bet I know how he votes. I bet I know where he lives. I know what his shoes are like, all that kind of stuff. But the reason that $12 Pinot Grigio was on the shelf at Southern Napa is because Carrie likes that bottle, has tasted that bottle, yeah. and will gladly recommend that bottle. What we find a lot is people will call, maybe it's a wedding or a big party, and you know they say they want two cases, five cases, 10 cases, whatever. And they say, you know, um, we, want, we want to spend this, and Carrie's like, okay, l let me find you a wine that delivers over that value of oh, yeah. $15. Because, you know, you can find there's hundreds of $15 wines, but Carrie's, Carrie always loves to try to find a $15 bottle of wine that you would taste and say, wow, that's, that's maybe, I would guess that's a $20 or $25 bottle of, uh, of wine. Right. And so that's, again, it's, 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 you know, every business is service and relationships, but that's, that's it. Being able to talk to someone who will make a recommendation based on who you are, what you like, and be able to talk you through it. That's it. And because we don't want you to be intimidated, but it, it, you know, if, if I got a French wine list dropped in front of me, yeah. I'm in trouble. Like yeah. I, I'm, I'm in trouble. Uh, I'm, and I'm in the quasi in the wine business. So that's I, right. I understand how people feel like that, but you know, our, you know, our, 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 store is an old farmhouse from the 1800s. It's very welcoming. It's cozy. It's not pretentious. You don't feel it. You shouldn't feel intimidated when you come in. You got three pretty girls that work there. Yeah. Um, that's, you know, it's a. So is business up or is business down during yeah, COVID? So surprisingly, shockingly, uh, I mean, we are up year to date from last year. Really? And, and without having one single on-premise event. And, you know, so Dave Miner came and did a wine dinner two years ago. We had. 105 people there at 175 bucks a ticket. Dang. And then those people bought a lot of wine. So a small business like ours, those nights. Those are big. Those are big. And we've had none. You know, yeah. None of those. And so we do lots of tastings and food pairings and um, people pay to come to those. And then they buy wine at the end of the night. We haven't had that opportunity, but it's forced us to, from a marketing side, there's a lot of things we've been saying for several years. We should really be better at this. We should do more of this. And it's made us, it's really forced us to do that. And it, we, we always thought that was a good idea. And I'm a marketing guy and it proved it has. Yeah. And so even when events come back, we can welcome people back with us. We're still going to do everything we've been doing during COVID. I'm going to say this when we come back from, I'm going to say it now and then discuss it when we come back from break. And that is a, an expression that I've heard so many times that I like and that the pandemic is an accelerator. It brings the future to our feet much more quickly than otherwise it could have. And I, and I love talking to people about what has accelerated in their own business. And it sounds like you've come across some things that has made you change that were on their way, perhaps, mm -hmm. and are right here in front of you. And let's pick that up when we come back from break. And what are we going to be trying when we get so back from we break? we've got two more wines, and one is just, it's really, so I'll tell you about it, and it's going to have a tie to you that you may or may not even realize. Dang. Well, we'll be right back. This is Cam Marston, host of What's Working. Jim Mitchell and his team at Signorama have provided all types of signage for nearly every event I've been a part of for years. I know his team's creativity, their multitude of products, and how easy they are to work with. His no mistake, Signorama is South Alabama's marketplace leader. Find Signorama on Facebook, 
Call 634-0100 or visit next to Mullinex Ford on Airport Boulevard. Think about your home. What do you see? Do you just see two stories or the stories of your toddler's first steps? <laughs> now think about your car. Do you see an odometer reading or your kids reading in the back seat? Other insurance companies just see a house. They just see a car. But a State Farm agent sees what your home and your car really mean to you. So why not give them the protection they deserve? You can reach me, State Farm agent Allison Horner, at allisonhorner.com. back. You're listening to What's Working. I'm Cam Marston. I'm in the studio with Jim Cox. He and his wife co-own Southern Napa Wine Store in, is it Daphne or Montrose? Daphne. Daphne, Alabama. And oh, old... God, Daddy, we're not in Montrose. We're just in Daphne. Sorry. Just in house. Sorry, sorry. Um, and, and an old farmhouse mm-hmm. where, and in our previous conversation, prior to the break, what you sell is not just wine, but it's education. It's connection. It's relationship. It's more than just the bottle. Uh, there's a lot of you're, you could pass a grocery store, a dozen of them between here and home that sell bottles. You do a little bit more, and it's an experience. Like uh, it is, it is an experience. And you were talking about our customers. So our day to day, come in, grab one or two bottles. A customer is definitely female. Skews heavy female. Our big purchase, uh, come in, buy a case of wine, buy a two hundred dollar cab, a three hundred dollar cab, is more. Uh, male dominated. Yeah, Tarzan uh, beat my chest. Look at this. I got a two hundred dollar bottle of wine. Fifty five, uh, fifty five and up uh, is there. Um, they that's what they'll they'll come in and make that more purchase. And a lot of them do it uh, uh, around lunchtime. Like yeah. we, we we track our sales by hours, and we see a lunchtime spike on those because a lot of them will pop in and do do that. So. Um, that's it. So I'll, so yeah, let's talk about the wine and okay, how this relates to me. Yeah. So, so the, the next one is going to relate to you. So okay. this is, um, so this is Leviathan. This is a red blend. Um, one of my favorite types of wine to drink, mostly Cabernet from Napa winemaker is Andy Erickson, full on rock star. used to make this wine, um, uh, called Screaming Eagle. If you can find it, it's, uh, uh, about, uh, 1100 bucks a bottle per bottle. If you can find it, yeah. you can get your hands on it. It's, it's big. And, uh, but this is one of the, he started his own project and he was able to get some great grapes and makes this, but compared to the Syrah, like this one to me, like top of the tongue, more big, it's big. Yeah, it is a big, and I like Napa cabs that are like big and blow your head off. And it's got some of that in, but it's got some petite Syrah in there. Uh, it's probably got a little, um, maybe a little Merlot in there as, as well, but a red blend is one of my, uh, favorites. And, Again, this is about about a forty dollars retail wine, but it is a uh, it's one of my go tos. And I should say, if I didn't own part of a wine store, my Tuesday night wines would be vastly different from what they uh, are. <laughs> at the, uh, uh, Carrie gives me a ten percent discount, which mm-hmm. is uh, nice. But this is a um, entirely different feel from the oh, from yeah. the Syrah, right? Very much so. Yeah, but it's it's a uh, it's it's big, and um, that's what I like. Uh, that's what I like about it. So I do. So we. We go to Napa a lot, and, and we've got to to really make some great um, some great friends out there and meet some great people. And we go to this thing in February called Premier Napa Valley, and it's 200 wineries that make wine a specific lot of wine just for this auction. And it's a it's an auction. It's a fundraiser for Napa Valley vintners. The wines are either in uh, lots of five cases, ten cases, or twenty cases, and you have to buy the whole you have to buy the whole thing. Um, and and so we have kind of our cool kids club, we all kind of throw some money in the pot and go out there and have fun and take some customers with us and buy this wine. So this is a 2016 Anthem, uh, Anthem winery. It's a super small, their, their top Cabernet, they make 375 cases a year of it. This is a special lot they made for 2016. There's 60 bottles of this in the world. Dang, and we I'm not opened, sure I'm worthy. You're definitely not, but we opened it here. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, anyway, I'm, I'm kidding. So, but okay, so I want, I want like, uh, and I opened this a while back, so I wanted to get a little, just a little bit, but um, like, brown, like, I get like some brown sugar, like um, maybe even um, like a, 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 maybe like a, a Cigar box a little bit, like oh, you. Oh yeah, uh, I can taste the Spanish cedar. Yeah, you see a little of that in there, and and all that comes from you know the the barrels, but mostly the climate. So this is yeah, I see you doing that, mm. inhaling over you, the wine. You want to get a little air on it. It sounds really 
Sounds really good on the podcast too. Yeah. So like that's that's big. Like that's that Oh, it's overwhelming. Fills up your entire uh and it salivary black, glands oh, big kick in on this thing. Black blackberry, yeah. And that's that's what I love about a Napa Valley Cabernet. So for me, French wines are uh amazing uh but they're very subtle uh uh, if you have a very complex palate, you can really, really get those nuances out of there. Like my wife can, I want a Cabernet to knock me right between the eyes. Like right. this one does. That's what I, that's and what that's I, why it reminds you of me. Cause it's big and strong and powerful. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, I, I was thinking more, you more the Sauvignon Blanc. If I were going to kind of, uh, I'm friend. sorry. So, yeah. so this is it. So one thing about Napa Valley is, uh, uh, in France, it's it's all about the vineyard. It's not, and it certainly is in Napa, but it's all about the vineyard where the wine comes from. Napa Valley is a lot more about the winemaker. So oh, really? You, so winemakers will make wines for different um, wineries, different projects. Some only make one, uh, but like this young man uh, makes wine for six or eight, maybe a little more than that. Some of the uh, very very uh, hard to get wines in Napa, and um, he went to St. Paul's. Did he really? Wait a minute. I think I know of this guy. He, uh, yeah, f- folks, St. Paul's High School in Mobile, Alabama. I am a graduate of it. I've got four kids going to school there now, and my wife is the volleyball coach. So we're deeply connected to St. Paul's, but I think I've heard of this guy. So uh, was here. I think maybe his parents got divorced, moved to Nashville and whatever, but Jeff Ames. Yeah. So went to St. Paul's and from Mobile. So a Mobile. He's doing good. Mobile, mobile boy doing makes, good. Makes some of the most uh, amazing small production uh, Napa Napa wines. We were, last time we were there, we were there last in February, and uh, bumped into him in the grocery store. Of all Get out. Yeah, bumped into him, and uh, he's been here back once to the store, and he keeps wanting to come back. Uh, his parents have a place at the beach, and he's like, "I need to come back. We'll do a tasting at your store, and that way I can I can see the grandparents, can see the kids." But so he's just not like like he's a big deal. Like his like he's not just doing okay. He's when doing really okay when. People out there talk about, uh, oh, yeah, Jeff Ames makes that wine. It's like your ears perk up. Really? Yeah. And he's he's great guy. Gosh, I love that. Super very proud of my school super, and very proud of him. Yes. Yeah, and, and, and not, but again, um, you know, would be in uh, blue jeans and boots and a long sleeve rolled up shirt. No. No pomp. None. None. Yeah. He's, he's. He's a winemaker, and uh, he's super talented. Let's talk about that. I'm glad. I'm yep. glad you brought that to my attention because our fundraiser is happening just about right now, Ooh. and that will be very, very <laughs> salient. Um, trends. I went online. I uh-huh. Googled wine trends. I'm going to throw these at you. I hope you haven't seen them printed over here. Wine in cans. So we have some uh, at, at the store. We've, we've sold some. Uh, some people we know make them perfect for uh this area, boating, beaches, those type things. It's just the, um, I think that the challenge, no matter what's in that can is, uh, you know, some of them try to say, drink it out of the can. To me, it's like, I, I still got to, I still have to put it in a glass. Yeah. But, but a can, you know, uh, craft beers are better in, it's better for the beer to be in a can than a bottle. The, you know, glass doesn't uh, heat up like aluminum does and all those things. But anyway. Yeah, so I, I would suspect wine in cans is on its way, much like people had a hard time getting over wines with screw top tops. Yeah, that like so the Sauvignon Blanc I opened up had one. That's twenty years ago was a big deal. Yeah, uh, now it's it's there's it can't go wrong. Like you you can't go wrong. Wine can't get corked. You know, yeah. corks a natural thing. I think we'll always have it because we like to do that. But like, don't ever be afraid of a wine that has a screw top. So some of my arrogant friends with their nose in the air who says wine come out of a can, you're going you're to say, we should say, hey, it's coming, pal. It is. You know, so a lot of restaurants you normally go to, if we weren't in the middle of a pandemic, they have wines in kegs. Yeah. And they're pouring it out of a, like a beer keg. That's what it is. It's yep. a wine in a can. How about wines? Dri- and this, this report says wine driven by the values of the, of the consumer. So do you support this uh, ecology or a green wine or, or something like that. Do you see people asking those questions? So uh, we do have people who say, um, is it organic? And it's kind of like, well, uh, yeah. Grapes are organic. Yeah, and there's a, there's a very expensive um, process you have to go through to get certified organic. But almost, you know, they most places that, that we know, small family farms, they don't use pesticides. You know, they don't want to do any of those, those things. So all natural, organic. But... Um, I understand people want to do that. Most of the stuff that is made 
small production family farms. They've been about they've been they were about that before it was trendy. Have you seen the video of the ducks that go into the vineyards and eat the bugs? I mean, just masses of ducks walking amongst the vines, eating the bugs off the vines. I have not, but phylloxera was a, you know, phylloxera uh, wiped out Napa Valley uh, decades ago. And there were actually dogs, it's a, it's a, it's an insect that gets in the root, but there were actually dogs that could sniff it out uh, and go through and help to uh, eradicate that. I've not seen ducks in the... It's a wonderful video. They're just uh, just feeding on it. All right, here's one. I can't wait to hear your feedback on this one. Cannabis-infused wine. So I, I, I'm not making it up. Here no, no, it is I, right here. Yeah, I, you know, I, I understand it, but I'm, I'm, are we solving a problem we don't have? Like um, one or the other, like or both, but not at the same time. Like that's kind of my, that would be my thought on that. Like, like I, I, I understand both. I just, I don't think I, I don't think I want it in there. Oh, we're putting cannabis in everything these days. So. I, I mean, it's, it's lotions and aspirins and everything else. It's, it's to come, you know, and I think it'll be a, a, a fad, a trend, and everybody will say, well, I'm going to get the benefits of the wine and the cannabis at the same time. It just yeah, I, doesn't seem like it's they. They're, you're saying there's two things that should remain separate. Yeah, I mean, and I, I don't um, like. I don't. I, I don't know if you need that in your wine. Like, I. I think, it, but it could be a trend that that's what people want. And if that's what you, again, if you if you want your wine to have cannabis in it, man, that's what you should drink. Yeah, yeah, or yeah. There's there's a way to get them both at the same time without putting one in the other. There is. Uh, you didn't hear that here. And, you know, we'll be the Alabama will be the 52nd state to legalize that. <laughs> That's exactly right. Speaking of which, um, what is it with the I, I hesitate to ask you this question, but Alabama state laws where we can't have any alcohol shipped to my door. It's, it's just. And what are we? So they hear the, the on the alcohol. So luckily, they, they're not really in the wine business. But on the alcohol side, uh, you know, they're. They're the importer, they're the distributor, they're the retail place. And so if you think about this, when you go to a, a, a non-ABC store to buy your alcohol, if we wanted to sell uh, Grey Goose vodka at Southern Napa, we could buy it by the bottle at the ABC store to sell at our retail place at the same price you as a consumer pay for it. If we buy it by the case, we get 10% off. So the state, the state sucks all the profit out of it on the front front end. And in that, and that's that's why they control all the alcohol. Can't ship it in. You can jump through some hoops. I, I can't even. I can't have wine shipped to our store from our friends in Napa. Let me someone send, send me a gift. They have to send it to the ABC store. I have to go there and yeah. pay forty five cents for each liter of wine I get. It's and and even the ladies at the ABC store are like Jim. Why don't? Why can't they just ship it to your store? I'm like I. I, mean, I, I know. It's ridiculous. We, the, the, we're going to be the 50 second state yeah. to get a lottery as well. Thank goodness somebody's managing our morals out there because we're not able to do it ourselves. Let's move on quickly. How so, about- hey, can I, can I t- let me tell you one thing about Napa Valley that always surprises people. So I, I love Napa. Napa is very small, 30 miles long, five miles wide at the widest point. So it's, it's tiny, Yeah, tiny. 4% of the wine from California comes from Napa Valley. Four percent of California. Yeah. So I've got a client in Monterey. I go down up, out there about once a year. Used to before the COVID. Right. And great, uh, great pinots. Great, yeah. Great pinots. Yeah. I found some great wines in the Monterey Valley. Yeah. There's great pinots. It's a little cooler down there, yeah. so they can grow pinots. Napa, you don't grow uh, pinots. Don't grow great there. It gets too hot in the summer. But uh, yeah. But Napa is very small. Um, but but they also account for I think you know about forty percent of the total dollar value of wine sold in oh. the state. So we're coming to the close of the segment, and uh, I want to tell people how to find you. Somebody's planning a dinner right now and wants your help. Where do they find you? 2304 Main Street in Daphne, southernapa.com, our Facebook page. We're um, easiest way. If you've ever had chicken in Daphne, you probably got it at Fast Times, the gas station. We are just one building south of there, 2.8 miles south of I-10. Come uh, come see us. You won't see me, which you're, you're not missing a thing. See my wife, Carrie, uh, Camille, and Lindsay, they'll take great care of you. All right, folks, I'll be back after this break with final comments. We're going to finish this wine and see what comes out. This could be strange. We'll be right back. Do you sometimes wonder about different money topics, but struggle to find the answers? The Every Dollar Counts podcast with Gulf Coast experts Josh Knoll and Jay Stubbs is made for those folks serious about their financial plan and looking for answers. 
Josh and Jay dedicate their time to explaining the various services and products available, as well as discussing lifestyle and money interests of the modern day family. Tune in to Every Dollar Counts on Apple Podcasts and everywhere else you get your favorite podcasts. Hi, I'm Cam Marston, host of What's Working. My carrier Infinity system is quiet, energy efficient, and runs like a dream. To keep it running smoothly, I rely on a maintenance plan from Keith Air Conditioning. With a Keith maintenance plan, your home or business receives discounts and 24-7 priority service. Give Keith Air Conditioning a call today at 251-476-3610 or visit keithair.com. Keith and Carrier, turn to the experts. Special thanks to Jim Cox. I appreciate anybody that comes on the show with stuff to give away. Doesn't often happen, and that's not the reason I do the show, but every now and then somebody comes in with what it is that they do or what it is that they sell in hand and allows me to kind of manipulate it and talk about it and discuss it with the guest. Well, when what they bring is a bottle of wine, there's nothing else to do but drink it. So we did. And there were several of them, and I've become a fan of a couple of those wines that I'll continue to look for myself. Uh, I'm certain Jim will need to be brought back on the show here before too long to talk about uh, whatever the next event coming up is. Let's say Mardi Gras wine trends, or after that, it'll certainly be Easter wine trends. Maybe there's some sort of solstice wine trend, and he needs to bring samples of that for each of those things into the studio for us to discuss and try and sample, etc., And rather than try to fill the remainder of the show with content uh, that may or may not make sense after what we've been doing, I've decided to drop in one of the Christmas commentaries that I do. You may or may not be familiar with the commentaries I record for Alabama Public Radio. They air Fridays at 7.45 a.m. and 4.45 p.m. Called Keeping It Real. They're my observations on life as it goes on around me. I'm going to toss it over to one of those commentaries introduced by my friend Corey Carpenter. And folks, that'll wrap it up. Have a good week, everybody. Merry Christmas. Happy holidays. If you don't get back to the show before the holidays. Oh, by the way, we will have a show on the 23rd that is our annual gratitude episode where we'll have people coming in, really giving thanks for some remarkable things that have happened to them this year. It's always very inspiring. Have a good week, everybody. On today's Keeping It Real, Cam tells us how the elf on the shelf came into his house and left prematurely. So if you have believers listening, beware. To get us in the Christmas spirit, I'd like to share some creative things my wife and I have done to deal with the elf on the shelf. If you have young children listening, change the channel now. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, this will be lost on you. But if you do know what the elf on the shelf is and you've had enough, listen closely. For us, the elf began as being cute. But in my household now has become something else entirely. It's cute like a growling pit bull is cute. Cute like a Portuguese man of war in your swimming pool is cute. Cute like sleep-deprived, crazed, and stressed parents are cute. It stopped being fun. We first embraced the idea. We created simple, funny scenarios around our house the elf had caused. But the kids wanted a new scenario every morning. And my wife and I would scour the internet to find simple ideas that we could copy. But after long days of work and all the normal stress of the holidays, having to create a new elf scene every night after the kids went to bed became a problem. We slowly began hating the elf and then began devising ways to get rid of him. First, the elf wrote messages that he had to return to the North Pole for a multi-day conference with Santa, and he'd be back next week. And since I travel to conferences a good bit, the kids thought it was reasonable. They understood. Then we realized we might could manipulate the kids by having the elf leave notes about their behavior. So the elf began commenting on discipline issues and grades and clothes left on the floor and how he had to report everything to Santa. And that worked for a while. But my wife and I got tired of all this and maybe made some bad decisions. The kids wrote a note to the elf asking if Santa loved them. We wrote back that he loved three of them. We have four kids. They freaked out, but they straightened up for a few days. 
The thing that helped my wife and me the most, but will probably keep us out of heaven, is when we had my buddy Greg, who drives the UPS truck in our neighborhood, deliver an overnight letter to the kids. I met up with Greg early on his route and gave it to him, and later that day, he came to the front door and handed it to the kids. It was a note from Santa, saying the elf had contracted the Ebola virus and was under quarantine, and if he lived, he might be back next year. The kids were crushed, and my wife and elf, I felt awful for a moment or two. Say... I hear the influenza virus is running rampant this year, taking out creatures, great and small, human and elven. Consider this a Christmas gift from me. I'm Cam Marston. I'm just trying to keep it real. To hear more of Cam Marston's commentaries, search for Keeping It Real on your favorite podcast app or find them on Facebook. Facebook.